you are now listening to the legendary yeah. Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. They handle the game so long, my thumb is bruised. number one DJ in the DJ 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 But the second play later, I'm gonna give a free ball to my wit. Okay, I like that. Yeah. Raheem gonna yeah. take care of you. You're now listening to the legendary Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. The number one DJ in the South is DJ Jack. Yeah. Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. Culture. Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast that delivers culture, true music. Would you join me please in welcoming DJ Rick? Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire. And my name is DJ Rip. And Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors the legends. And without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary DJ, the legendary mixtape DJ, the legendary Southern icon. I want to welcome to Vinyl Esquire, DJ Jelly. Yo, 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 what's up, Rip? What's up, my dog? How you doing, man? Man, I'm blessed, brother. I'm blessed. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, Vinyl Esquire is dedicated to uh, uplifting the DJ culture, and you are definitely a part of the DJ culture. Very important part. So, with that being said, I want to get right into it. I want to start from the beginning with DJ Jelly. I start every interview the same way, and we're going to get right into it so we can get into your history. So, why don't you tell me who or what made you want to be a DJ? Well, I mean, um, you know, being young in the 80s, you know, I love breakdancing and you know, hip hop period. So um, I used to do, uh, we used to do like parties in our high school. Um, and we, used to, you know, sometimes we'd skip high school and go to my, down to my partner's crib and just hang out. And uh, one of the, one of the older cats down there used to always DJ. So I was like, man, I know I can do this thing. He was scratching uh, Houdini Big Mouth. I was like, man, that look easy, man. I'm going to try that. So I just started playing around with it. And then one of my mentors at the time, uh, Cutmaster K, I'm originally from St. Louis. So one of my mentors, Cutmaster K, he used to always invite us to the parties. Even though we were young, we would carry his crate. And so he was always mixing, and I just enjoyed listening to the mixes. So I'm breakdancing, listening to the mixes, and then I started playing around with the cuts and stuff. So, I mean, you know, this was like the mid-'80s. So it was, you know, I was like, man, you know, I got the hip-hop bug, you know. Right, right. It was a vital part of my upbringing. So what year would you say this was exactly? This was 85. 85. 85. Uh Uh-huh. So would you say that you started DJing in 1985? Is that the starting point? That would be the starting point, yep. That's the That's the same exact year I started DJing. That's dope. That's what's up. Okay, yeah. so so uh, so talk to me a little bit about that. You know that time. I mean, was DJ Jelly your first name? Yeah, DJ Jelly. Well, DJ Jelly Bean. Um, okay. Because I like the LL Cool J crush you like a jelly bean. So I just and they used to my nickname was Jelly Bean. Mm. So that came it all came out at the same time. So that was just you know like when the Cool J came out what eighty. I guess it would be uh, or eighty seven. Yeah, I'm bad. I would say about eighty seven. Right. 87. So I started using that as a cut. So, you know, that's what I started doing, just using that jelly bean. Yeah, this is 87. So you would you started out as a turntablist, you would say, or, or a scratch DJ? What what was your approach to uh, what kind of DJ did you want to be when you first started? Um, it, it was a little bit of both. It was it was scratching and mixing. You know, that's you know, I just took it as, yeah, I just wanna it wasn't so much as saying, hey, I want to be a turntable. It was just like, man, I just want to DJ. I just want to be able to rock a party, cut, put together some blends, all that. Just the whole thing, the whole package. So that early that early time frame, that, that mid-80s to the late 80s, you're, you're starting to DJ. You're jelly, DJ Jelly Bean. Jelly Bean, yep, DJ Jelly Bean. DJ Jelly Bean. So this is in St. Louis, Missouri, right? Yeah, this is St. Louis. Got you. So talk to me about those early times in St. Louis, uh, DJ Jelly Bean. What, where, where was the transition to DJ Jelly, and when did you move to Atlanta? Well, I moved to Atlanta in 89 when I got out of high school. Oh, okay. So to, yeah. So before that, I mean, you know, the, the hip-hop 
culture in the um in St. Louis was just okay. You know, we were just basically mimicking obviously everything that was going on in New York. And you know, we had a couple of crews in the neighborhood. Um uh crew names I don't totally forgot about. Um but you had people like Charlie Chan who was Charlie Chan Soprano, who DJs for Run DMC now, who's been doing that for the past, shit, 20 years. Like, we all came up together. And then, of course, my man, Cutmaster K, used to do all, my mentor, he used to do all the parties, all the college parties in St. Louis. So we basically just run around, just, you know, creating a lot of excitement for the neighborhood, you know, in St. Right. Louis. I'm really from U-City, same neighborhood as Nelly. Um, Got you. So, so eventually, once I graduated from high school, um, I moved to um, Atlanta. Okay. So I was, you know, it was a, really a notion of this. Uh, my mother was reading a, a, a Essence magazine, and on the cover it had Bobby Brown builds like a this multi-million dollar house in Atlanta. And then I, I saw her reading, I was like, you know what? That's where I'm going. Like literally, I connected once she was reading that article. Like I saw it. I was looking over his shoulder and saw it, and I was like, well, that's where I'm going. So you didn't so, have, you didn't have uh -huh. any family or anybody in Atlanta. You just no, moved. No, no one, no one. I just connected with the article wow. literally and said that's where I'm going. Just, just not even on some. Well, Atlanta's the new mecca. None of that. But you know, well, obviously I felt it was an opportunity when I saw Bobby Brown being in the hospital. Like, Damn. Okay, right. let me see what's happening. Right. I was serious, so I just made it a point to go to college to Atlanta, and so here I am in '89 going to Atlanta. And um, my first, my first DJ, well, my first gig was uh, working at Peppermint Records, and this was in late '89. You so said, I got into college. You uh -huh, said, you ahead. said, you said Peppermint Records. Peppermint Records. It was a chain. It was like a Sam Goody. Oh, it was oh. Like in West, oh, so yeah, rec it was record in the West store. End, yeah, it was in the West End Mall. Got you. Uh, which was the hood store where the AUC was located in that area, and you know there was you know all it was just a thriving place. Five Five Nine was located over there, so this was like the hub for the hood over there. So I nice. got a job at a record store when okay. I was in college. Um, I went to a, a art college, ACA, which is now Savannah. Um, so I DJed. And then my first job would be Magic City at the end of 89 because I um, worked at Peppermint Records. Then I got a job at Bobby Brown's studio, just kind of gopher for the engineers. Got you. Okay, so, so now. That all that happened in 89. Well, so 1989, you moved to Atlanta. You start yep. going to school. And imme yep. immediately you start working at a record store. Yeah. All right. So now your first DJ gig there was in the famous Magic City Strip Club. Yes? Yeah. Famous Magic City Strip Club. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then you say you started working as an intern at Bobby Brown Studio. Yeah. So let's put it, let me put it all in uh, order. So I got a job at Peppermint Records, and then eventually, um, as I was in college, I got hooked up working at Bobby Brown Studio. We went on a uh, field trip, so to say, in, in college, and I ended up meeting Bobby Brown's, um, the guy who managed Bobby Brown Studio, which was Boss Town at the time. Boss Town, um, got it. Uh -huh. And then um, I got a job there. I got fired twice um, at the uh, Bobby Brown Studio. Never met Bobby Brown, but the engineers, they were just, Real funky because I was cool with all the artists that would come in. People like um, the group back in the days, Basic Black, uh, People Bryson, yes, um, uh, Gene Gene Griffin, who was the Suge Knight of that time, right? Who obviously you know put Guy in the mix and all that. Teddy Rollins. So I was cool with all of them. Just cool, you know. I would do my stuff over at, at the um, studio, and then at nighttime, the, all the artists would come in, and I bring my turntable and. Just kick with everybody. Right. So eventually I got fired there twice, whatever, whatever. And then what's so crazy is the second time I was about to get fired, I went to Magic City to hang out to see about getting a job. I would go around to different clubs, obviously, just hang out and see what was going on. So as soon as I got fired from Bobby Brown Studio, a week later, DC from Magic City, who was the head DJ there, that's the guy who wrote Whoop, There It Is. Right. He hired me. He called me. And I was just like, well, let me go. You know, it was just coincidence that happened. I got fired. A week later, D.C. called me like, yo, you can have a spot down here in Magic City. So that was just crazy. This is like late 89. Wow. So we're still in 89. All of this happened immediately when you went to Atlanta. Yep, immediately when I went to Atlanta. I mean, I went there just balls to the wall. I just went. 
I hung out everywhere, literally. Wow. So, okay. So talk to me just a little bit more about the Bobby Brown experience at Boss Town and tag team. So you said DC Supreme, right? Is DC that... Supreme, correct. Right. So DJ he... DC <laughs> Supreme, yeah. Right. So and he was from the group tag team with yep. the, you know the hit record whoop there it is. Okay, so so talk to me just a little bit about a little bit more about this experience. I mean, because you go from St. Louis to Atlanta and you're automatically in the midst of now, I don't hear about any hip hop yet. I'm hearing a lot of R and B here with Bobby Brown. Talk to me just a little yeah, bit more yeah. about I all mean, all of this. I mean the new jack thing was was really happening. Um, in terms of the industry, because, you know, uh, you had people like Babyface in L.A. that had moved here during that time. Right. And, then, and of course, the New Jack um, swing stuff was really, really popping on the industry side. But in the streets of Atlanta, it was all about the bass music. Gotcha. It was all about the booty shake music in the streets. Right. Not the industry side, but the streets. And then it was so crazy is during that time, so much happened in, in 89, um, literally, like, um, I would go to the flea market and hang out, and there would be Jermaine Dupree in there kicking it with his artists like Silk Tom Leather and uh, JVR and the Straight Jackets. Those were, those were his first artists that he put out. Right. And they would be performing literally in the flea market. This is Jermaine Dupree's artist. Yeah. Prior to Criss Cross and So yep. So Deaf, right? Yeah, this is all in 89, bro. Right. Um, so I would see, you know, I would go hang out at the flea markets. I would go hang out at the clubs. But like the uh, Bobby Brown experience, I would basically, you know, check in, clock in, run and get um, lunch for the engineers. I would, um, of course, set all the settings on all the mixing boards at that time. So I was learning about engineering as as that process was going on. Right. And all the R&B cats, the industry obviously would just be at the studio. Not the hood, but just the industry people. So be strictly R&B during that time. Right. But the excite more the excitement was on the streets with the bass music. People like Raheem the Dream, um, Shy D, um, Kilo. Well, Kilo would come the year later once I really got into a Manny City during the during 90. So you just mentioned a few legendary MCs or rap artists um, that came from Atlanta. Or came out of yeah, Atlanta, during, right? Yeah, that was in Atlanta during that time. Okay, so uh, talk to me about that. What what was your affiliation, or how did you fit in DJ Jelly? Now, when did you become DJ Jelly and not DJ Jelly Bean? Well, that would happen in ninety. Ninety was a tr was a transformation. Um, I got obviously um, at the end of eighty nine. I got into uh, Magic City DJing. So here comes along. Um, I'm in college during this time too. Okay. So I um so here's the thing. I ran into this guy on on the martyr. His name is Freddie B. He's a producer. Right. So I'm on the martyr. That's our obviously our Atlanta Transit. You know, I'm on martyr. So I ran into my guy Freddie B. He's a produ He was the main producer of the whole Oom Camp sound. Gotcha. So I'm running. I'm I'm on. I'm in college. I'm on martyr. Kicking in. I got a um a R8 drum machine in my hand. Um in the box. And he, he approached me like, man, you know how to use that thing? I was like, no, man, I'm trying to learn how to use it. So we got to talking. He was like, yo, man, I got I got a partner of mine who's looking for a DJ. He need a DJ. We're going to make these mixtapes, and he's looking for a DJ. He really needs one. I was like, well, cool. What's up? So I'm the whole time, I'm just wide open, beast mode. I'm like, cool, let's go. So I ended up meeting MC Assault. So this was 90. I'm at Magic City. I'm at Peppermint Records, and I'm going to college. How I'm doing all this at one time, I don't know. And I graduated from college. I can't believe it. So we meet up with MC Assault. He's like, man, I want to um, make some mixtapes to take out Edward J., who was the reigning mixtape king of Atlanta during that time. He was the man in the 80s. He came up in the you know, 80s and 90s. King Edward J. And he was he, a, he was like, a DJ. He was a, he was more of an MC. Okay, gotcha. But you. he was the bit he was the businessman of the Atlanta mixtape sound. He was the king of that. Gotcha. He had, he had a whole crew of DJs like DJ Smurf, who is now Mr. College Park, Kizzy Rock, all these DJs up under him. Lady DJ Bonet. He had all these D, He had a crew of DJs. Okay. So they was killing stuff in the streets during that time. So I got with MC Assault, and then we started putting together mixes. He said he wanted to make conceptual mixtapes like i want to do a whole gangster mixtape because during that time in atlanta hip-hop was new so people would do their mixes like they might do 20 minutes of booty shape and then they might do like another 20 minutes of just like just popular rap during that time whether it was tribe called quest or whatever it was nwa whatever it was at that time but we would do 
what we ended up developing was a whole conceptual mixtape from a 60-minute mixtape of whatever it is, whether it's booty shake, whether it's clean music, whether it's slow jams with the bass, 808 bass. So we started creating a production in the mixtape game during that time. We didn't do a lot of talking. Mm, okay. Every day was known for talking. So he it would be like, he was equivalent to how New York was. They had a lot of talking on it and music. So he would be on the advertising. What we ended up doing was just making a production out of the mixtape, making it like a real remix, a real, like you listen to an album. Right, right. So that was our approach, production. So the guy that met Freddie B, you know, he he knew how to do the um, 808. He was real talented. Um, MC Assault, he was the kind of, the, obviously, the brainchild to say, you know, let's put together this DJ Jelly and MC Assault mixtape. So was this, this your was, first introduction into the mixtape game? Yeah, that, and this was yeah, this was ninety. This was the uh, this was mid ninety, nineteen ninety. So the first mixtape DJ Jelly did was DJ Jelly and MC Assault in nineteen ninety. Yep. What was the name yep. of the mixtape? Um, the first mixtape was called the Mac Mix. Got it. The Mac now the Mac Mix was basically all the NWA stuff that was out during that time, all the all the funk during that time. All that Dr. Dre, all that shit. Right, that right, right. So would you say yeah. that you got known in Atlanta from this particular point? These mixtapes is what projected DJ Jelly? Um, not with the first ones, because we were basically out on the street. It really, I think it, it ended up really popping off to a whole type of level in 93. Once we started getting consistent in the streets, and 93 Freaknik really broke us B, where we were dominating the streets and the Southeast region at that time. So in between 90 and 93, you yep. were, you were we, just consistently putting out these mixtapes and still doing everything else that you were doing? Yeah, I was still, we were, you know, during 90, 93, I was um, putting out mixtapes. We were beating up the clubs with the mixtapes. We were beating up the streets with the mixtapes, the parks, and just really spreading it on a consistent basis. And it started catching on. I mean, we would be out in the streets literally Sunday through Sunday wow. during this time. Got you. Sunday through Sunday. Um, I started doing, I started between 90 and 93, I started doing the clubs too. I started doing club spots. You know, I would um, do Sharon, uh, Sharon Showcase, I'll uh, do her spot. She was known for most, she was known for bringing a lot of the, uh, nightlife to teenagers during that time she was doing it legally but right you know the te she was known for the teen spots everybody messed with sharon sharon showcase during that time got gotcha. you i don't care if you were outcast or whoever you whoever you knew in atlanta they would go through sharon sharon showcase gotcha i was located basically i had a spot in the uh on the west side of town of atlanta um, that's where we would hang out and work on our mixtapes. So I worked at Peppermint Records, um, Magic City. So I had the whole kind of West Side feel. That was that was kind of my side of town territory, and MC Assault as well. So anyway, so nineties we end up creating our first mix, couple of mixtapes. Ninety one, we end up meeting Big Oom in ninety one in the park. That was my next question: was how how did you get affiliated with Big Oom? Um, in Maddox Park, um, MC Assault. And um, we ran into Oomp in the park, Maddox Park. And one of Oomp's partners were cool with MC Assault. And he really was like, yo, Oomp, these dudes been out here hustling. You need to really connect with them. He he felt we had a good vibe. Um, So we ended up getting with Oomp. MC Assault started running the game. He would basically, MC Assault was the person that would just get everybody amped up and just put shit together. Okay. He was, he was that dude, period, Um, hands down. So Oomp got involved. He was like, man, what do y'all need? Y'all need some money, which y'all need. So he ended up making an investment with us. And we ended up going and uh, getting a store at Old National Flea Market. We mm. got a spot so we could set up the mixtapes and start running the mixtapes out of that spot instead of being in the streets all the time. Right. So we would have us a stable spot. So we ended up getting the flea market booth at Old National Discount Mall, which to this day, we still have a booth there, <laughs> which is wow. crazy. Wow. Right. It's like low overhead. It's not it's just the hood spot. Right. Um, so here it is, ninety one and ninety two, we're just basically putting together our, our little empire in terms of we're getting spots all over the town. We're going to the east side, um, flea markets getting a spot. We're going to the north side, we're going everywhere. Buford Highway, flea market. We would go to these different sides of town, get flea market booths, and we put we would put workers there. So wow. that was, that's, yeah, we started doing that. So eventually between 90 and 93, we ended up getting over 10 spots, 10 flea market spots. 
So that's wow. how we started really, really cultivating and, and putting out that, those mixes. So that's how Big Oomp Records, the record stores, got started. From from that concept. Wow. Because yeah, basically they were all DJ WMC Assault booths. So you, so wait, so, let me get this straight. So you guys had 10 spots in all the flea markets around Atlanta just to sell your mixtapes, not other people's music, no, like a real a, record store. Yeah, not, well, eventually, now, we'll, we'll get to that part. Okay, okay, got you. So so here we are grinding out. I, I end up, 93, I end up started messing around with um, the infamous 559 Club. Freaknik already kicking off. Freaknik's been going on since the late 80s. But by the time 93 really hit, it really started really, really jumping off and getting more organized. Right. Um, they started having fest- one big, big festival that was coming out was Luke. He would come to Freaknik and uh, 69 Boys. Like, it started really getting huge. So, 90, 93 or so. So, all the artists started really coming into Atlanta, like, from everywhere, pouring in from everywhere. Okay. Mind you, the Olympics ain't got here yet. That's 96. It hadn't got here yet, but it's, the talk is already out of the street about the Olympics. Right, right. So, 93, we up here just really punching in. So, what started happening is I started working at 559. So, then we started putting together our Big Oomp movement during that time. Big Oomp Records really jumped off in 95. Okay. Literally. So, during this whole time, we basically kind of, you know, getting oomp, like, hey, man, we need to do a record label. We need to do a record label. MC saw putting that all in his head. And oomp is slowly but surely, he's like, okay, that's it's cool. Because we started really, like say, expanding all these flea market booths between 90 and 93. So Freddie B and MC Assault started working on different productions. So MC Assault, he used to be the uh, DJ and um, obviously an artist, so he wanted to put together an album. So he and Freddie B and we had another partner, Starvin Marvin, who was basically like our guy who would just make sure we get all our shit done. You know, he'd be, he was like the supervisor, make sure everything was done right. Right. They started putting together music in a group called Major Bank. Now this is this is late '93. So '94 we started just working on the Major Bank album, and and Oop still wasn't totally convinced about doing the record label yet. But he was just like, okay, I got, I start buying equipment so y'all can have a studio, basically. So he put together that he invested in the studio. Cool. We ended up doing that. We ended up completing the Major Bank album in '94. That was the era we started really putting together the music and the sound. Okay. And then. Um, 95 we made it official to create big old records from that once the once the music was done we started hitting the streets in 94 with the music and then Oop was like okay let's just go ahead and just put the record label together he was convinced by that because he just saw how all, we were all grinding right and moving in the streets and all that he was just like cool as long as it's making sense people getting hip to um assault and jelly's name he felt comfortable he's like my money's been spent with Right, right, right. So, 95, we started the label, and then we had the first album, Major Bank, which didn't do nothing, um, but it was cool, though. But we started, what we started doing in that process in 94, as we were working on music, we started putting together um, the merchandise. So, we had the DJ Jelly MC Assault shirts. Um, then, as we moved into uh, 95, we obviously started creating the big oomph designs and shirts. Right. So, we would, and we would roll with, uh, we had at least, 30 to 40 people that we rode with on a regular. Wow. Like, literally, we would walk up in the club, 30 deep, all black, wearing big room shirts, DJ Jelly MC shirts, salt shirts. So we would mob everywhere, literally. How was Big Oom Records distributed? Was it just all hand to hand and in the streets? It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was strictly hand to hand. Got you. At, fir- at first. We would strictly do that. 95, here we are, we popping off. We got the first product back, it was hand to hand. We started doing that, and at the same time, Oak ran into an old uh, artist that he loved, Sammy Sam, who was a street legend. Right. Period. Right. Hands down, he's like he's like the DMX of Kooji rap um, of Atlanta. He, but he, but he was yeah, but he was everything he rapped about, he did. He was a nut, he was a knucklehead, but I love him to death. Right, he's right. Straight, straight hood. That bought more credibility to the label. The Major Bank project was cool, but when Sammy Sam got picked up in 95 that just really set everything off period because gotcha. everybody fucked with sam in every hood with that happening at the same time as the label did in 95 they just kind of really jumped it off like okay they here for real this is some real shit so i so okay so you got big old records now major bank and sammy sam are the artists right yeah yeah and dj jelly and mc assault 
are still correct. entities for Big Oom, correct? Correct. So did Baby D come later and some of the other artists that you work with? Yeah, Baby D and them came. This is They came and they, they were hanging around in 95, um, but Baby D really didn't jump off until 98, 99. Got you, got you. And, and, you no, know, they were kids. Monte, ninety five, ninety six. Monte, baby D, they would be hanging out. They would come. To, they would work at the flea market booth. Got gotcha. you. Um, and just hang out. You know. And does that include? And, you know, they were like, "Yo, we want to be artists too." Right. Um, and intoxicated. The group we have intoxicated. Who um who was really they were they were really on some other shit. Um, they're the artists that we created a record with them in two thousand four called Walk It, and then obviously. Migos took it and did talk it, right? Which we, which we won in the court battle, and that's a whole nother story. So that was cool too. Wow, okay, it is what it is. Yeah, that's yeah, that's like recent. So ninety five, ninety six, we jumping off with Sammy Sam. We started doing shows. We started hitting the road with Sam, mm, and okay. we started and we started putting a lot of people out on the road during this time. Not, okay, let me back up a little bit. Ninety four, ninety five, we started hitting the road a lot. So we started going to Texas. We started going to Florida, Alabama. We're hitting all these states, spreading the mixtapes and the labels. Okay. we going down ourselves, hand in hand, just, you know, hustling. Right. Selling, selling products. So that's what we did during um, 95, 96. We started really spreading it. And then obviously with the help of uh, Freak Nick, a lot of people started getting more hip to us. Like in 93, they started really getting hip to what we were doing. Um, so every year, 93, 94, 95, 96, Freak Nick, obviously we would have booths set up as well slanging the the label and the mixtapes so so were you doing regular dj mixtapes as well around this time with other people's music or just your own no 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 we always did all people's music gotcha i would break like up in 93 man i bought a ball mjg me and um bought a ball mjg down to um atlanta like i would already started doing stuff like that promoting and bringing artists gotcha. so i would always break other people's music but at the same time we had our label too absolutely, so that's, absolutely. that's the thing you know we had our artists and they would, it would just go hand in hand that's and dope mixtapes. i would play everybody's shit i mean i was man doing like 94 95 um 96 i was playing all kind of shit i was playing all new york stuff i was mixing stuff up obviously a lot of the west coast stuff during that time right well and then, um and obviously, you know, during 93, 94, all the outcast stuff, I started doing too. So let me back up, man, because there's so much going on. Um, I forgot I had I started doing the mixes in 93 at B103. So before you go there, explain to me how you approached the mixtapes. And the reason why I say that is because I've listened to a lot of them, right? And you, you always seem to blend a lot of different styles together and a lot of different artists together. And it was real mixes. And it always gave me some kind of, kind of connection with your style of mixtapes with the flea markets kind of with the West Coast swap meet tapes. It always yeah. felt like there was some yeah. kind of connection yeah. there. Talk to me a okay. little bit about that. So not only was I influenced by my um, mentor, Cut, Cut Master K in St. Louis, but I was always fascinated by Dre's swap meet mixtapes. Got you. And I listened to a lot of Ron G during that time. Those two DJs I listened to a lot. Ron Absolutely. G with the, with the blends and then um, Dr. Dre's approach with with his tracking, how he tracked, yes, and would and would break his own shit with right. along with everything else. So that's what I ended up doing, basically, basically subconsciously. I would just listen to both of them. Got you. I just wanted to bring that up because the multi-tracking style that Dr. Dre was doing with those swap meet tapes, it was incredible. And what you were doing was incredible as well. And it's just interesting how you say that you broke this stuff in the flea markets. And that's yep. that's kind of how they broke a lot of the music in the swap meets in L.A. So it's just it's kind of interesting that that similarity and and how you uh, how how you approached your style of mixtapes as well. So now let's go ahead and get into it. How did you get on the radio in Atlanta? Um, from the buzz on the street about the mixtapes because during that time, you know, they didn't have a lot of hip hop on the radio in Atlanta. So basically, the DJ Jelly MC Assault mixtapes were the radio. And obviously, Edward Jaina, we were basically running, that was everybody's source of hip hop in Atlanta to get to hear what was new, what was going on. So the radio, B103, they obviously was like, look, man, we need you. We've been hearing about you. We want, to, want you to bring that flavor to our station. So I ended up doing B103 and 93 for a year. 
Okay. Um, me and Ryan Cameron, I would do a nine o'clock show that was all hip hop with Ryan Cameron. And then on Saturday nights, I would do like Booty Shake and electronic music during that time, like Egyptian Lover and all right. that type of stuff. And, you know, Nile Fish and all that type of shit. I would just bring all that type of vibe. Right, right. So, but my approach was definitely, definitely, um, we would do, we were doing mashups before they were called mashups, period. Absolutely. We were always doing that. And my mentor, Cup Master K, he would always take like rock acapellas and mix them with, um, you know, like hip hop beats from the East Coast. So just the, I'm, I was already on that. And then being from the Midwest, we would always listen to all kinds of music. Anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just having that influence as well, that just, I was just a, a product of all that. The reason why I acknowledge that is because I'm from the Midwest as well. We got a lot in common, Jelly. I, I'm, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, okay. M- Missouri isn't that far from here, right? So, right. So, so the point is, is that I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I started in 1985 as well. And a lot of that inspiration comes from the east, the west, the mid, and the south. Yep. Because the Midwest was always, especially at that time, there was no sound for the Midwest, right? True. I mean, you might get house music from Chicago and maybe yep. a, just a little bit of hip-hop with Twister and, you know, yep. a little later, right? But overall, in the 80s, there was no Midwest sound. So we blended everything. Everything, bro. So, so, so yeah, so it was always east, west, south. It, and that's why I always felt like I always had a non-biased approach to music and hip-hop. Because, mm, because, there you go. That's that's very true. Now you say that, it's very true. And it, come, it, and, and it comes out in your talent, your music, and your art because you're originally from the Midwest. So yeah. you applied that to your Atlanta movement. And to me, that's what made you great and your movement great. So who would you say at that time that you really broke in Atlanta from a national standpoint? Who would you say, because you got mixtapes and the radio. Is there a few well, artists that well, you... Well, def- definitely Outkast was my first jump off, period. Okay. Because in 93, they was, they was strictly about the West Coast movement during that time on the radio, politically. And I just started really dabbling in, you know, playing the Outkast album. It's, it's funny because 90, 93, 94 on V. Um, one, it's so crazy because I first heard Outkast on on the Christmas mixtape, the LaFace compilation. Right. And I was just kind of, I was like, oh, that's kind of cheesy. Uh, I was like, ah, oh, whatever. With players ball. You know, ball. when I first heard it. Yeah, you talking about. Know, obviously, yeah, I was just like, I thought it was cheesy when I first heard um, players ball. Right, right. But. Um, I saw the video at Club Nicky's when the video first dropped and I was blown away and they had it on the projector. Right. So when it came on, I was just like, you know, it just killed me. When I visually saw them, I was, I was blown away by the video. So then I had to regroup. <laughs> then I started playing it on the radio because I was just blown away. Period. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it all, and that all happened in the nine month period from listening to the compilation mixtape of, uh, face Christmas. But then seeing the video, I was just like, Oh, I'm, I'm tripping. They are fucking killing this shit. Right. Because I got it. When I saw the video, I got it. I was like, okay, yep, that's dope. So I you... started banging it hard on V, really pushing it. And um, from there, they had, you know, the face records obviously announced it. Um, Outkast ran into me. Um, Big Boy and Dre pulled up on me at um, one of our flea markets on the east side, wanted me to go on tour with them. Mm. Um, I couldn't at that time because we started putting together the big oom stuff during that time. Right. So I right. really didn't have time, you know, and I, and I wasn't really rude. I, I, we were always cool. So that was dope. You know, I was just like, really like, man, I wish I could, but I got to do this. So that was, that was a blessing just to, I mean, to be affiliated in the part of that legacy as well. So that was amazing. Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's what happened during that time. I want to bag it up too. Um, just as a side note. Yep. In 89, in 89, I went to a, 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 a Luke concert um, at the Dome at that time, which is no longer there. It was, that was all, it was a hip hop show. Um, it had Run DMC on it, it had NWA, it had EPMD, it had uh, the DC Boys who blew everybody away. Right. Um, at the time, and LL Cool J. The DJ I saw opened up the show, who was a DJ for the show, he was fucking shit up. He was, he was, uh, he was beat juggling with Hold On, he was cutting was uh my, no, my dog wins he was fucking that shit up i was just like whoa dj he was killing it dj bro. wiz 
Wiz, your boy. Wow, really? Yeah, Wiz. Wiz was killing it, real. He was going off, bro. I was wow. so blown away. He was killing it during that time. He had 89 at the concert, the big uh, Luke concert. So, by the way, just for the record, DJ Wiz is my counterpart for Vintage Tunes, our production duo. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was he was fucking that shit up, bro. So, I just had it for that side note, and I was really blown away. He was, I was like, okay, they doing it like that in Atlanta. This is the big yeah, arena, so. right? And he was, yeah. so Wiz was the opening DJ for this concert. Yes, sir. Wow, that's yep. dope. Okay, yeah, he was fucking that shit up. But yeah, that's that's what's going on. So yeah, so we so we let's bring it back. Um, ninety five, ninety six, we got everything cracking. Right. Um, and then ninety six, obviously the, the Olympics come here. We weren't a part of that, but obviously we got a lot of the flow of the people who came into town. It was right. just flea markets. Hey, where should we go? What music can we get? And they wanted to hear what was going on in Atlanta. And during that time, um. I mean, we had a lot going on. Edward J, me and Smurf had the infamous DJ Jelly Smurf battle during that time on mixtape. Um, Incredible. He, he was in he was in college. I was in college. He felt to some kind of way like, oh, who this Jelly dude is. He put out a mixtape called Je- going, Jelly Fishing, going Jelly Fishing and Jelly Fishing. <laughs> nice. I was like, whoa. Right. And in the talk, we ended up putting our infamous mixtape called the 187 together. And uh, we had a tag toe. It was from that um, Ice Cube um, cover he had, this dude with a tag toe on him. And it was us. And we, we just destroyed the J team. That's what Edward J's team was called, the J team. And we killed them. We went in. We had people rapping on the tape, dissing them. We had the mixes. This and them, we just destroyed their whole crew. We shut it down in the city. Everybody just doing like 96. Everybody was blown away. Wow, wow. Whoa, we had Sammy Sam on there rapping, this and them, everybody. We just came at them. So would you like say would you say that that's your most famous mixtape? That was one of them, definitely. That was, yeah, that just, just that whole, that was when we shut down the J-Team. Like, we shut them down. Like, people stopped listening to them. Like, we really shut the city down with that. So how did you approach, because we're talking about mixtapes now, but we were talking about radio. How do you as a DJ, and this is very important for other DJs who uh, who do mixtapes as well as radio, or, you know, ones that do radio and not mixtapes, or vice versa. How did DJ Jelly approach mixtapes versus DJing on the radio? How'd you approach your mixes? I, I approach them just like the mixtapes. I don't, I don't take it. I, I really do. You know, like I, you know, I might have days where I might just do a straight blend. You know, back to back blends, and you know, you know, doing simple transitions. But for the most part, I like to layer and I mix against myself. Like I might have a ten minute segment that's multi track, but then I'll go in and mix it, and then come out of it, and you know, I just I'll mix against myself. So I still approach the radio just like I do a mixtape. Wow. Okay. And then obviously with Serato, I'm able to to reenact a lot of stuff because I have stuff set up. So that's kind of dope too. That the technology obviously helps in these recent years. Absolutely, because it was just too. The multi tracking is pre recording, obviously. Yeah. But when you're yeah. live, you got you have two records, right? Yep. Versus Absolutely. now with Serato, you know, cue points and samples and you know pre production and all kind of things that you can you know drop in on the fly, no question. So with that being said, Jelly, we're in the late '90s now. Let's move forward. What what was uh, I mean? You have an incredible uh, incredible history here. Talk to me about the crunk movement. What was your involvement in crunk music? Because in it. Atlanta, you had these waves of different styles of music, right? And um, right. you had Booty Shake, and then here comes, you know, uh, you know, of course, you got Sammy Sam, you know, your whole big... Um- Who was doing the hood gangster stuff that was like um, the hard boys before him, CMP, they were like the real right. gangster hood, Atlanta hood. Right, absolutely. And then, and then Go ahead. Know, obviously, we had the obvious outcast and dungeon family movement which was more about the the rhyme scheme and the consciousness absolutely and the, and the consciousness absolutely here comes crunk what what was your involvement in the crunk movement um in the crunk movement um uh, well once well first of all crunk movement basically we took a lot from and i say atlanta we atlanta took a lot from the memphis movement with that whole gangster walk type vibe how they program the snares and the hi hat. Yes. Um, a ball MJG. Um, obviously, my boy SMK, producer who was like the godfather of the Memphis sound. Right. Right. Um, we took a lot from them. Paul and Juicy J would come to the flea markets, drop off. Now we were playing some people like they. We slaying some of they mix through the flea market. Um, Paul and Juicy J. So a lot of that stuff started happening through that. Our own group we had intoxicated. They were crunk. Um, that was the group during that time. Um, Lil John hadn't even really hit. Yet, right. Um, we had people like Kizzy Rock, 
you had um uh Mr. Koo who had a song called Born Threat and Kizzy Rock, DJ Kizzy Rock, he would do these chants like Who You With and all that, which Lil John stole from him, mm, okay. which would be, be noted as crunk during that time period. This was like right after the Olympics. Right. So we're talking like so, 96, 97. Yep. 96, 97. Right. So that started to develop. It was really hood stuff that, and people started programming their beats like Memphis type stuff during that time in Atlanta. So we had a group intoxicated and they were straight crunk. They were wide open. So this is 97. Um, so then Lil John, he still, Lil John wasn't really even now. He started doing some, he was still kind of doing stuff like um, booty shake type songs. Um, you know, they would consider me the hood DJ. Lil John was mostly in the reggae during that time period because he had a reggae show in the mid nineties on V. So right, he was doing right, reggae. He right. was doing him and Thirsty was doing New York and reggae. Even though they're originally from Atlanta, they was doing New York and reggae. Right. Yeah. Reggae. Yeah. I've talked to Wiz about his involvement in, in a couple of those early reggae remix records with John too. Yeah. 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 And on another mm -hmm. note, I've talked to DJ Toomp, you know, about you know his involvement with Crunk and Trap, and he had he accredited. Memphis as well. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So go ahead. So we we modeled our group off of that during that the Memphis sound intoxicated, and they've been they started getting hot in the streets. Then you had people like uh, Baby D. He was doing the East Side West Side, you know, the robberies of the, of the zone. Okay. So we started creating those kind of beats. That's our involved. We started coming from that end. So then you had people like Pastor Troy who would come in and out of town. He started creating his sound during that time too. Um, obviously, uh, Beast by the Pound, they were they were influenced on us as well because they shit was crunk. We start everybody just started calling it crunk. In right, the right, right. So that, so the whole uh, that sound started really popping off too. The whole masterpiece stuff. Um, so we all just started calling it crunk. Just everybody. We'd be in the club. That just became the slang. Like we'd be in the crunk. We'd be in the club crunk. Everybody started saying it. Right. This is ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah, because the first time I ever heard the word crunk was Sean Paul on one of the early Youngblood records. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So, so uh, definitely the Dungeon family and the Attic crew and all of that obviously must have been uh, emerging at that time as well, right? Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were. And, um, I mean, everybody just started putting this really replicating the whole Memphis sound and the Beats by the Pound sound during that time. Gotcha. And coming up with our, with our own flavor. Um, and then during that time, um, I got a job, a 97... I got a job at Hot 97, I mean, during that time. That came to hip-hop station. The first hip-hop station came in 97. So that wow. jumped off, too. As we were doing these sounds, obviously, you know, hip-hop hip -hop started coming into this market through radio, finally. Right, through right. Through hip-hop station. So 97, here I am. I'm, I'm getting a job there. You're back on radio, um, right? Back on the radio again. Um, and during this time, actually, let me back up a little bit. I started hitting the road with Goody Mob at the end of 96. Goody Mob started jumping off. Okay. 96, 97. So I started, I was their first road DJ. They started getting real, they started banging. Um, and then Hot comes along. They hired me. They picked me up. They're like, look, we need you at the radio. And I was like, well, let me switch it up and go to the radio. And so here we are on the radio rocking this stuff. Um, the crunk movement is going on in, in Atlanta, obviously. Everybody starts saying this terminology and slang and start making beats like that. Memphis sound. Right. Um, and then here comes along Outcast with Elevators. I'm at 97, working on the air during the holiday. I forgot which holiday it was. I'm not going to even lie. And um, Gip and Andre come up to me with this um, ye this yellow label. It wasn't a black label. It was a yellow label. Um, they was like, Jelly, we need you. We need you to start really. We need that support. So I was like, fuck it. They gave me the record. I played it like for 30 minutes straight. Elevators. I never heard no shit like this. I was blown away. And I started just banging it in the mix wow. 30 minutes 30 minutes straight um so LA here, here you go again me. breaking outcast on the radio on the radio la reed calls up to my program director cusses him out he wants me fired wow i didn't know what was going on because i mean obviously they my boys i'm like well shit um we have a meeting um and my program director he was cool steve haywood thank god he didn't fire me um he smoothed everything out with, with la reed but the problem was it wasn't supposed to be heard and that forced him to have a release date earlier than expected. Yep. So that's that's gotcha. what happened during that during so, that time. So they so they, that might not even have been the single. Who knows? Right. right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Because it was a little. Di it was a little different from. It was very different. Yeah. It was. It, it was. Di it was different from the first album, the first records, 
And yeah. uh, I mean, it was an incredible record, though. The sound of it and everything, the sound of it. Nobody heard that kind of music right. on a hip hop record during that time. And um, I didn't give it them because, well, obviously, they were my boys, and I just love different shit. Right, right, absolutely. Oh, so, so, so now we're in the late '90s, right? Obviously, going into the 2000s. So, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Big Oomp Records with all the artists, DJ Unk, and and your whole movement. Yeah, Unk didn't happen yet. It was Intoxicated, Sammy Sam, Baby D. Yep. During that time, those were the those were the three holding it down. So, so Baby it, D started getting his production in late '97, '98. East Side, West Side happened, and then there's a club called The Bounce. We started jumping off real big. Yes. And Baby D would hang out there all the time. And we started banging these records. So I would throw, during this time, 97, 96, I was throwing these birthday parties at 559 and the Bounce and the Warehouse. I would wow. always do that. I'd do about two or three parties a year. Everybody would come out. Goody Mob, everybody. And we just hang. I would put on shows. I would have all the bass artists during that time, Raheem, everybody perform. Wow. During the time. Kilo, Incredible. everybody. 97, 98, 99. All the time. Outcast did my party in 99 during that time. They killed it, too. Gangsta Boo. I would have everybody. Because, you know, just being on the road DJing, being on the road promoting, being on the radio and doing mixtapes all at the same time, I would come across all the artists. And a lot of times, it was so crazy is I would have artists just come through my house, come and do a session or rap on a tape and do all that during that time. Wow. So is that is that what kept you busy in the 2000s? That's what kept Yeah, definitely. Well, really, um, the Baby D success, um, 99, 2000, 2001, kept me busy. And then, obviously, Unk happening, following after, well, Intoxicated still, because they had that record, um, Walk It, Talk It, that jumped off during 2004. And then Unk came right after them. Like, all those artists, they jumped off strong during that early 2000s. Right, big right. They jumped off, and and I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jelly. I remember the infamous house. So the first record label I ever visited when I came to Atlanta, I started running the core DJs in the late 2000s, and I came to Atlanta, and I came to Oom Camp Records, not the record store, but I came to a house, and yeah, this is the, the it's still there, it's the office. <laughs> wow, this is the first time I ever went to visited a record label in Atlanta. Right. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been to labels in New York, you know, and et cetera in L.A. But when when I visited this house again, right. I'm like, OK, there. I'm going to the record label. Big on. OK, cool. And we pull up to a house and I'm like, <laughs> OK, so the record labels in a house <laughs> and the whole house from top to bottom studio yeah. offices, everybody. I mean, it was just amazing. And I was like, wow. And yeah. um, it just opened my eyes to the grind. And the independence uh, of what Atlanta had to offer from from a, a hip hop music standpoint, you know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I used to live in the bottom part of, of the house. <laughs> See, um, I, I didn't even yeah. know that. That that's yeah. yeah. Dog, I used to man. I still got records over there. I need to go and get while I'm thinking about it. Wow, um, wow. And I would have all man. We would do cookouts. Um, this like ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. We would do cookouts over there. All the artists would pull up in buses and all kinds of stuff in park on MLK. Right, and just man. Kick, and just kick it. That's we, it. it, it it's we incredible. Just really, we just really, and we nobody knew what we, nobody really knew what we were doing, but we wanted to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right. But that's that's all it was, man. It was just a passion, just to do this shit. So you know, in the late, like I said, late '90s, um, Sammy Sam had a record ride with some players. It jumped off real strong, um, and I was on hot during that. I mean, hot during that time, breaking that. Um, and I want to say when I was on Hot, I was given the opportunity to do the first Atlanta mix show, the 5 o'clock traffic jam. That's how I broke a lot of stuff like DJ Taz, That's Right, the Kizzy Rock Records, nice. the Rock Me the Dream, The Most Beautiful Girl, all that. So, so this was the first all-dedicated Atlanta, Atlanta mix, mix show. show. Yep. Nice. One, one hour. One hour. Wow. One hour, bro. And I, I ran that for two years. So how long... Would you say? Because you're still on V103 to this day, correct? Yeah, I came back in V in 2005. So you've been on the radio in Atlanta, major radio, breaking records off and on since... 93. 93. Wow. Uh -huh. That's incredible, Jelly. That's incredible. I'm not, I, you know, I'm going to be listening like, okay, yeah, you know, it's been 93, though. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, you know I don't, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but uh, Big Oomph Records and your events is what kept you busy in the two thousands, right? You right, know. and it yeah it, it pushed our brand more. But you know what? What opened my eyes was 
in, in this whole movement that we were doing, um, I have a real good friend, Darren Davis, who's in the regular industry. He hooked me up with a lot with uh, like the whole Goody Mob stuff. And he would take me to all the How Could I Be Downs and yes. um, Mix Your Power Summit, yep. the core DJ stuff. Y'all. Like that helped me too as far as my network. Right. Outside, outside of Atlanta. Of Atlanta yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that really helped me out a lot as well. Like I can't, all those things I can't even single out. You know what I'm saying? Dismiss. Like that, all that was important. Absolutely. But it, you know, what's incredible, Jelly, is the fact that, you, you know, you're a Midwest, you were a Midwest kid from yep. Missouri. Yep. And, yep. and you moved to Atlanta for school and for obviously a connection that you had when you saw that, that article. But you got there before, you know, it really just became, because Atlanta, Georgia right now is the mecca for hip hop. You know right. what I mean? It is the hotbed. It is not where hip hop started, obviously, but it is yeah. the go-to place in the world for hip hop is Atlanta, Georgia. And you are a staple of the hip hop culture there. And you're a kid from the Midwest. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. So, so with that being said, what is Jelly working on now? Um, Jelly is um, managing. I got a, a young producer, Big C from Southwest Atlanta, very talented. I got a group that I manage, um, John Boy and Surround Sound. John Boy is the producer of the Wobble Song. So he created the Wobble Song. I yes, sir. Through um, Smurf and VIC rapped on it. But um, I'm doing that as well. And I'm doing a lot of events. I do a lot of events here in Atlanta. And I book a lot of shows for a lot of the artists. I do a lot of that for them as well, like old artists and young artists. And I'm still rocking on the radio. And that's it, man. I'm just, I'm moving. I just um, got into a partnership with another record label called In Crowd Music. Okay. Um, one of one of the guys used to be with Bubba Sparks. His name is Scram. He used to be one of Bubba Sparks' artists. Um, so I started that, and with Attitude. Attitude is a writer. Uh, used to be a writer for Timberland. Yeah, absolutely, I know. Started, mm-hmm. Yeah. We started a label called In Crowd. Literally, we did paperwork last week. Literally, so we just started that. We have a, a young country artist, Sierra. We do a lot of. It's a lot of work up in Nashville. I've been getting involved with. So that's nice. what's been going on too. Yeah. So just keep it. Just enjoying the music, man. Just doing multiple things with music still. And uh, and Big Oop is coming back, right? Big Oop. Yeah, he says he wants to get back in. He's just waiting for some of the uh, music to bubble up strong. Right. Right. Um, he has a whole. Uh, young roster, um, Tay Drain, which he's he's real tight. He's actually Baby D's artist, so he's Oomph is gonna do a deal with Baby D and his artist. He has another artist called Chico, so Baby oh. D is keeping that going, and nice. and he's about to drop a Baby D project soon. He's just w- making sure that the music bubbles up. Boy. Absolutely, get the buzz right. Well, all yeah, that, the all that, got, the buzz got to be right. To me, all, so obviously, obviously, I'm on helping on that end too, as well. Got you. So, to me, I mean, it, it's all incredible because it sounds like everything is coming full circle, you know, and yeah. and and things are coming back into the independence, and uh, sound like we're getting ready to get, you know, we need to prepare for a bunch of incredible music. So, exactly. uh, so Jelly, is there anything that you think that the world doesn't know about DJ Jelly? Um, I mean, obviously, I don't think they understand the full connection of what I've done in Atlanta and what I do. Really, they, I don't think they really know or they kind of know, but they don't really, def, they definitely don't know. Well, I hope that this interview helps that out a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, definitely. So let me ask you another question. Do you feel like, because it seemed like you've been there from the beginning of uh, Atlanta's hip hop movement. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, because there's a lot of connections here and there's a lot of things, you know, like with L.A. Reid and Babyface moving to Atlanta, creating, you know, LaFace Records, you know, with Outkast buying Bobby Brown's Boss Town Studio and creating Stankonia, you know, and so many of these things that um, a lot of people don't connect the dots with your history, with radio, strip clubs, you know, and all of these things. Do you think that Atlanta's hip-hop history has been told correctly? No, not at all. That's, that's kind of where we had the period of, too. And, um, you know, me personally, I'm definitely will help create that whole new dialogue because it hasn't been told. It's been It's only been told in spurts so far. Right. This is the beginning, really. It's only been told in spurts and not in detail, so... We, we're about to start that next chapter up. Absolutely. Great, great, great. Hopefully I can help with that. I know we talked a little bit about about that in the past, so, you know, we're going to put that together, right? There you go. There you go. Exactly. We are. So what, yeah. what motivates DJ Jelly in 2019? Man, as always, it's always new artists. I'm a, I'm a geek for new artists, period. I, I've always been that way. Got you. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan first. 
well, I think that helps. That helps a lot. The fact that I'm a fan, and the fact that I that I personally feel and I know that that hip hop, you know, not to sound all um, booty about it, but hip hop just saved my life, and I and I and I I, I, I respect that. I respect hip hop. Absolutely. At the end of the day, all always, even with the whole new movement of trap and the sound of rap and whatever's going on, it's just that it's the essence of what has been created this hip hop movement. And it's it's still relevant to me today as it was back then. Absolutely. Well everything goes in cycles, you know, musically. Yeah. Hip hop isn't yeah. any different, yeah. right? And uh Exactly. I mean and hip hop saved a lot of people's lives. I don't know what I would be doing if I wasn't a hip hop producer, DJ <laughs> You exactly. know, just hip hop. Period. This is all I know and all I remember, right? So, right. so with that being said, you broke a lot of artists in your career, and I think you're ready to break the next one, right? Exactly. Oh yeah, it don't, it don't stop. It don't <laughs> stop, bro. Right, right, right. It Absolutely. Not stop, bro. Absolutely. So, uh, so how can our listeners follow DJ Jelly? Um, they can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at the Real DJ Jelly. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Jelly, I want to really thank you, man. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and allow myself and uh, Vinyl Esquire to interview you and peel back all the layers of your vast uh, history. You know, as a DJ, as a, as a record breaker, you know, as a mixtape DJ, radio DJ, and 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 everything that you've accomplished and done, and everything you're going to accomplish. And uh, you're now listening to Vinyl Esquire, the DJ podcast, and this is the legendary DJ jelly yes sir hello world i want to welcome you to vinyl esquire the podcast that delivers culture truth music